Senator Klobuchar, let, let's start with the strong economic news out on Friday. The economy added more than a quarter million jobs, better than economists expected. Unemployment is at its lowest level in almost 50 years. Wages grew faster than prices did. Do you give President Trump the credit? I give our workers and our businesses the credit, Jake. Uh, when you're out there across the country, you see people working harder and harder every day. And this has meant that we are our businesses are strong and we're selling American goods. That being said, a lot of people aren't sharing in this prosperity because of the cost, the cost of college, the cost of health care, uh, the fact that the president had promised that he would bring down the prices of their prescription drugs, and that just hasn't happened. So when you get out there and you see the energy out there and the concern, talk to farmers who are trying to sell their soybeans. Uh, there is people out there. Uh, that are not sharing in this economic prosperity, and it's not fair, and it's not the American way. Uh, so while we attribute a lot of this to our workers and to our businesses, we know we can do better as a country. Unemployment is the lowest it's been since I was nine months old. You're really not going to give President Trump any credit for that in terms of his tax cuts or deregulation or anything he's done? Uh, you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about when we were in that downturn and President Obama came into office, and he had to deal with that with the Congress uh, to try to, one, right the financial industry, and then, two, uh, get us on the road to recovery. And I remember that the Republicans were giving him grief uh, when he took any credit for that. So I think that we have had policies in place, starting with President Obama, that have aided that recovery. But what I believe is that we should be governing from opportunity and not chaos. And my problem with uh, President Trump, and I think the problem you're seeing from the citizens of this country when you mentioned those numbers and what's happening is they see chaos every day. They wake up in the morning and they see a mean tweet um, or they see some inconsistent policy uh, that causes chaos during the day. They want to have a leader that their kids can look up to. North Korea test fired multiple projectiles this week, and here's how the president responded on Twitter quote, Anything in this very interesting world is possible, but I believe that Kim Jong-un fully realizes the great economic potential of North Korea and will do nothing to interfere or end it. He also knows that I am with him and does not want to break his promise to me. Deal will happen. What do you make of that, Senator? And if you are elected president, would you be willing to meet with Kim Jong-un? I would always be willing to meet with leaders to discuss policies. But my problem with how President Trump has handled this is not that he's had meetings. Uh, it's that there isn't a plan and there isn't a real negotiation tactic, and he is not working with our allies as he should. Maybe he should listen to Otto Warmbier's mother, who just this last week talked about the fact uh, that we should be upping the sanctions and putting more pressure on Kim Jong-un. I don't see this as a victory that he launched these test missiles. I don't see that as a victory at all. And I also don't believe we should be conducting our foreign policy by tweet. It's a very, very hard thing to do, but you've got to quietly work and you've got to have summits that produce results where you don't just don't fly over, get no result and come home. Senator, you said on CNN this week that, quote, we have another presidential election coming up and this president has every reason not to protect that election, unquote. What do you mean by that? Are you suggesting that President Trump wants foreign election interference in 2020? First of all, we have ample evidence that he has not been responding to protect our election security. And you know what? Russia may have done he, they didn't use a tank, they didn't use a missile, but they used a computer, and they invaded our democracy all the same. And in the past, he's used the word meddle. <laughs> well, meddling is what my, I do when I call my daughter on a Saturday night. This was actually an invasion of our democracy, okay? This isn't asking your kid, oh, what are you doing tonight? This is an invasion of our democracy. But you're saying he wants, so that, he wants that again? At, I, th I don't know what he wants. All I know is he's not acting like the leader to protect our national security. Because if he wanted to do that, his administration wouldn't be stopping the Secure Elections Act in its tracks. They made calls from the White House when my bill with Senator Langford was headed to the floor. They wanted to stop that bill that would have required to get assistance from the federal government for election equipment. It would have required backup paper ballots. 
uh, multiple states do not have backup paper ballots. It would have required auditing. It would have required better information sharing. We now that know that his own Homeland Security secretary was told not to talk to him about the threat to this election. We know that his own FBI director has said that 2018 was a dress rehearsal and that Russia is going to try this again. His director of intelligence said that they're getting bolder. All of this happens, and what does he do? He goes and coddles up to Vladimir Putin again, has a little nice talk with him, and never even brings this up, according to his own press secretary. That is wrong, and he then makes it worse by calling it a hoax. I follow you on Twitter, and I, saw, I think we I, I, need to protect our nation's security. And as Martin, as Marco Rubio said, you know, one time it was one party, and the next time it will be the other. I follow you on Twitter, and I noticed that you said that voters ask you much more about uh, the opioid crisis in this country than they do about Robert Mueller. You've just unveiled a new $100 billion plan to fight drug addiction and fully fund mental health care. The Trump administration, I should note, has also taken strides in combating opioids, including declaring a public health emergency, signing bi bipartisan legislation in October. Uh, U.S. attorneys are now suing pharmaceuticals. Um, do you think the Trump administration deserves uh, any praise for, for their efforts on this issue? They have done some good things, and I've worked with them on that. But the point is, everywhere I go across this country, I don't think there's been a town hall meeting uh, where someone didn't ask me about mental health, uh, or drug addiction. And by the way, Jake, it's not just opioids. Ask people um, who live in our black communities what's going on here. It is also meth. It is also cocaine. All right? And what is going on here right now is that we have got people that don't know where to go for help. One out of two Americans have addiction in their family or with their close friends. One out of five Americans have a mental health problem. And for me, this is personal. My own dad struggled with alcoholism my whole life growing up. He got two DWIs in the 70s, and nothing happened. By the 90s, he was facing a choice of jail or treatment. He chose treatment. And in his own words, he was pursued by grace. And that was because of his faith, and that was because of treatment and our family and his friends. And so I think every American should have that right to be pursued by grace. That means enough beds in this country for people with mental health problems if they're facing a crisis. That means doing something about our mounting suicide rate uh, for farmers, for veterans, for LGBTQ youth. And that means, instead of just talking about this, actually putting the money into treatment. And I have a proposal that's paid for by, yes, two cents per milligram fee on these opioid pharma companies that have made tons of money off the backs of people who got addicted. And you can use that money for not just opioids. You can also use it for these other drugs, as well as mental health. Uh, it means making sure on the road to recovery that you've got a job and you've got a place to live. And there are so many people in this country that are crying out for help. And we've made this transition away from the mental health institutions for good reasons, but then we didn't replace it with anything. And I also have a background from the criminal justice system, and I, can, I know what happens when people don't get help. Uh, lastly, Senator, uh, and quickly, if you can, the, the front runner uh, in your 2020 primary race, former Vice President Joe Biden, hit the trail in South Carolina for the first time this weekend. Uh, Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are already pointing to major policy differences they have with the, the vice president. Where have you disagreed with Joe Biden? I'm looking forward to the debates to talk about that. I think he's just launched his campaign. But I can tell you where I'm coming from, Jake. I am someone who's running from the heartland. I'm someone who is taking on the issues of our time, uh, whether it is the infrastructure proposal I put out there. I was the first candidate uh, to put out a fully paid for infrastructure proposal. I'm someone that is taking on this mental health and addiction issue, and I've been fighting on farmer prices my whole life. So I'm looking forward to the debates with all of the candidates, and so we can air out our differences. And I think you're going to find also uh, that there's a lot more that unites uh, the Democrats that are running than divides us. The key is that we need a leader in the White House, and I believe I am that person who can unite this country, who can bring us to a better place in our politics, and start governing from opportunity mm -hmm. instead of chaos.